a great one. I'll say just a few things and, and, and then let's have a broader discussion. Uh, but no, thanks. Those are uh, really uh, lots of things to challenges to to <coughs> respond to, and, and some of them I'm not sure I can respond to. Uh, but clearly, the one about relativism is is the one that that is most fundamental to to what I have to say in the paper. But but I was very fascinated today by the first remark you made, which which is an observation that. Um, that I find very interesting, and I hope you develop it uh, further, which is that if you take internal reasons seriously in politics, then that democratizes, in some sense, democratizes the place of rationality in politics. It's a very good and interesting thought, um, and, and, I, uh, and I haven't really heard it being put that way before, so, so I, I hope you'll, you'll elaborate more but here are some initial thoughts that come to mind about it. Uh, so, so here's, it seems, is, is, is there's thought, and I think it's really worth thinking about. His, his, his idea is that if it is the case that reason is just not given by some Kantian bias or some general principle, you know, the pursuit of social equity, utility in politics, and if it's given by just the motivational psychologies of ordinary citizens, each uh, reason for his or her own. It democratizes the place of reason in politics. Now, you see, I think the word democracy here has to be taken seriously. I mean, you know, it's not just a, uh, it's not just a matter of proliferation, because there is a sense in which if you take democracy, for instance, to be given in the idea of a general will, then the proliferation is, is, is not where the democracy lies. And, and you see, if you take a very specifically liberal view of democracy, then, then you're certainly right that it does so. But I think it's really a question as to the extent to which, given diverse points of view and so on, you might nevertheless think that democracy consists in not this individualistic proliferation, but in the individuals coming through consensus to a will or to a set of commitments that captures the social whole, right? So to use Carol uh, Gould's term, the, the social ontology may be crucial to actually characterizing what, what uh, the democracy is. Uh, and, and these are open issues, I think. Um, and I think, I mean, my own sense is that, you know, we. I mean, it's something I've been working on, and so we should talk about this so, because the remark actually uh, makes me want to line it up with things I've said. I, I myself really do believe that we don't have a phenomenology of democracy. See, I, and I think Rousseau had, was on to something very powerful. I mean, I think the idea of how the social whole, as a fact, so, so this would be a policy, <coughs> how the social whole navigates the, the polity. Right, which is not just given. I mean, Kenneth Arrow was as good as Rousseau uh, on this, you know, through the conduct of line of thinking. It's, it's just, you know, voting is an irrational procedure. It's a completely irrational procedure to come to, to, come to some idea. So we need a, 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 to navigate it in some holistic sense. And, you know, it's, uh, we, don't, we don't really have a phenomenology of, of this idea of this the social, uh, we, we have an ontology, so we can talk about you know methodological holism versus individual, but we don't have what it is for an individual mind to navigate something which is larger than his preferences and uh, you know his internal rationality. And we don't have democracy in any substantive sense, I believe, if you just have that. So, so I mean, look, here's what I mean by by phenomenology. Then we need a, a social and a, a version of it to understand. Uh, this came to me when I was teaching my daughter how to drive a car. Right? This is a phenomenon. So here I am, I'm driving the car, and she's sitting next to me. And when I'm in the car, I, I actually see the world, the road ahead of me and so on, from the point of view of the whole car. I mean, I'm not seeing the road as an individual sees, you know, from by my lights, I'm seeing it 
You know, when you're driving, you see it from the point of view of the car, the, you know, some rather larger thing. And then I turn to her to tell her, well, you know, this, and immediately I lost that larger thing and I was just me talking to her, which is a completely different phenomenology. So you literally have to turn your head two inches when you're driving and you lose the, the, the larger thing. And you, you know, so you switch back and forth. Now I think you can't really get, you can't really get to, to the issue of democracy without seeing rationality in this larger sense, where you have to see the motivational psychology in larger terms. Otherwise, I don't see that, that you've, I mean, unless you declare yourself, you know, the way that people like Elster and all do, which is that you know, you're through and through individualistic, and so democracy has to be theorized in those terms, I, I think it's a disaster. Uh, uh, so we have to do much more work on this, but it's a very fascinating suggestion, and, and I think there's lots to, to discuss. Okay, welcome back, and I'm, uh, I'm going to field questions uh, to the extent I can. I'm interested in that too. We're going to bring you the mic, and keep in mind you're being videotaped. Watch what you say. <laughs> As I was listening to Uday, I was thinking, you know, I have got similar stuff. Now I have courage to, you know, voice them. Uh, the whole contractualism is kind of based on an ahistorical moment, uh, and it ignores embeddedness. In other words, a uh, veil of ignorance has long been torn at any moment, and life is is uh, too embedded to be pulled behind the veil of ignorance. So, you know, it's Cartesianism, not touching reality, ignoring the embeddedness is, is, uh, seems to be the problem we are trying to bring up if, if I'm not wrong. I, I also have a problem that you didn't have a, enough problem with the notion of identity and with the notion of conception. Two deeply Cartesian concepts. Uh, identity and identicality, let's put it that way. You can be without having your identity, without your own representation as a card or as an object that you carry with yourself, as a cognitive object. A lot of people might have uh, conceptions of good life, not, let's not call it conception, but experiences of good life <coughs> without thinking of it as a conception. In other words, that, that good life being conceived has le been left behind so a long time ago that it's no longer articulable unless philosophers thinking about third parties. In other words, they are so embedded that they don't think, they are not aware of the boundaries of the good life. It cannot be objectifiable by them or others. And uh, similarly, conception assumes that the good life is ahead of you. From a distance, you choose it. But the, Oftentimes we are born into you know, conceptions of good life. We leave them and so we are unaware. So it's more common sense than uh, an ideology that we choose to be. So, so th this seems like it's all a kind of uh, uh, pragmatist criticism of uh, liberal conception of uh, identity. And I wonder how far do you go in this since you had to cut short with relativism. So, my name is Mujahid Biliji. At his sociology at John Jay College. Thank you. Another question, Adam. Um, oh, yeah. Do you want to answer? Oh, you want to Sure. Um, you, you know, you're absolutely right that pragmatism is is driving what what uh, I've been <clears throat> saying, and that's part of the the reason why. I am not particularly disturbed by by the anxiety that they expressed, um, which is why isn't this uh, a, a relativism uh, inducing uh, position? Um, and and here is why I'm not anxious about this. You see, if if you if you give up 
the epistemology of fallibility and revisability as absolutely central to political thinking, as it is in that. Uh, you have to ask, on what grounds do you think it is not central? Why, why should a pragmatist um, not be made anxious by uh, just the sort of thing that uh, Professor Mehta was uh, articulating. I mean, why should a, uh, if you take this pragmatist line, it, it, what, what follows if you take the pragmatist line is that you cannot talk about values, or for that matter, beliefs and truth, um, except from the point of view of the inquirer. This is something, for instance, that, you know, Rorty, who was a very uh, maverick form of pragmatist. Right? Um, for instance, he has nothing to do with Peirce, which is bizarre, um, uh, given that he's much of the time writing about skepticism and knowledge and so on. Uh, but if you take the Peirce view of pragmatism, all inquiry, including political and moral inquiry, is from the point of view of the inquiry. So the inquirer can't jump out of his skin right, and say, oh, well, but here's my opponent, and he has a different point of view, and I'm going to just sort of step outside my inquirer's point of view. This, or to put it as John McDowell does, there's no sideways on view, right, where you can step outside of your inquirer's point of view and say, oh, well, here's, here's me, and, and uh, th this is what I think of it, treating myself as an object with things. And here's my... Uh, um, illiberal opponent, etc. And look, everything is all of a piece. And the, the, these people have to be. Uh, he may he may win and he may lose. But, but that's not to understand in what sense I've given up on men and, and roles and so on. Right? It, it's really to say that you cannot you cannot <coughs> inquire into politics and morals except from within a point of view. And you have no other point of view but your own as an inquirer. So from your point of view, is you, and this is what it is to absolutely deny that you can step outside of all your points of view. If you, it doesn't mean you can't change your mind, but it's like Norad's quote, you know, you, you change your mind fr from some other point of view of your mind and your position in inquiry at a given stage. So, so from within my point of view, I have to see the other person as wrong. Now, now with that quotes the uh, Berlin is saying, I can only tragically subscribe to my liberal position given this problem. But those are crocodile tears. I mean, if you really understand pragmatism, there's nothing tragic about this. In fact, it's, it's and Williams is the same, but Williams is very influenced by as I put it, the way close friends and uh, but, but this is simply to miss the point that uh, once you give up the Cartesian epistemology, the Millian epistemology, and, and indeed the Rawlsian epistemology, there isn't any point of view but your own. Right? And so when you, and I don't like the idea of a, a dialogue, it's not my view. Every time I hear of intercultural or interreligious dialogue, I just want to hide under the table. I mean, I, you know, it, I, so for me, it's history that provides uh, uh, incoming information, which may be inconsistent with what I think, and then I have to deliberate in that way. That's the Hegelian. Uh, and, and my claim is that it's an essential part of pragmatism that when you're inquiring from a certain point of view, you simply have to take the claim. You, you simply have to take the stance. There is no other stance you can take unless you think you can, you can step outside of all of your value commitments, etc., which is incoherence. Uh, you, you can't uh, fail to be uh, Optimistic is, what is, is the term I was using, maybe that's a bad term, about how history may uh, change things in your favor. So, uh, so, so, so here's my thought. I've got a certain 
set of commitments. I can't think from outside my point of view. I come across somebody who has, you know, a different point of view, etc. And I have to, 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 to respond to it. And maybe I cannot give him or her internal reasons to change his mind. But I can't give it to him at a current time. But subjects are in history. They're not synchronic subjects. They're subjects in history. And if they're in history, you have to take the view as an inquirer that history may introduce internal, uh, what I was calling infirmity uh, or dissonance in a person's values whom you are engaged with. And of, of course you may, uh, you, you may yourself change your mind, but from your current point of view, you don't change your mind. From your current point of view, you believe it's the truth. If somebody says, if somebody comes to me and says, well, but maybe the earth is flat. I'm not going to say, well, maybe. Just, just get lost. Uh, just think, you, you, you're, you're running a, a science foundation. Somebody says, well, maybe the earth is flat. You say, yeah, maybe, maybe I'll give you some money. Maybe you should pursue it. You don't do that. You just take your current point of view to be the point of view. It's just what the pragmatist says. So, so the idea is that if somebody disagrees with you, you and you, you, you sort of wait for, you try and convince the person, and, and if there is an impasse, I don't think you can take any other stance. You can't take any other stance except to say, well, the, what I was calling the optimistic stance. It makes it too contingent to say it's the optimistic stance, but you just have to take that stance. Um, unless you can climb out of your point of view, the inquirer's point of view. And that's the pragmatism. Uh, that's really what the pragmatism, and uh, the pragmatist has to say. And there's nothing tragic about it. I mean, you know, Williams is, is uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Isaiah Berlin is just straddling the pragmatist view and the, the uh, Cartesian view or the Millian view. And, and I don't think he can be, he's sort of schizophrenic about this. Otherwise, he wouldn't say it was tragic. You've conceded too much to the idea that you can step outside of your, your views altogether if you were to say, um, you know, uh, I can't do better than this. Uh, that suggests you can, you, 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 uh, that you know, there's a possibility of doing better, but the possibility of doing better depends on an incoherence. Uh, which is that is a neutral position you can step to and adjudicate between you and your opponent. Well, then you're not taking your own point of view then. That's, that's really what the pragmatism is. Hi. Uh, okay, so uh, I, just, I, I really like your paper. Um, the way you, you set up the standard liberal argument, I just have a question about how neatly it fits the authors you discuss. So you say that in this, the structure of this argument, you, the standard liberal never justifies the policy of non-interference in virtue of some conception of the good or any substantive ethical value. But I was thinking, if you think about Rawls, it's true that when you go into the original position, you don't have any of the conceptions of the good that you do have normally, but your motivation for going there is uh, out of fairness and equality, right? So the reason I don't know what other citizens, uh, you know, what kind of person I'm going to be in the society that I'm imagining is so that I think of everyone, I care about everyone equally as much as I would myself, regardless of what religion they are or what conception of the good they have. But you can't say that at the outset, right? Because that, that means it will be fairness in and fairness out. You want fairness to be the outcome. So you can't build in talk of fairness saying this is my reason for doing this, etc. It's not part of it's not part of the doctrine. Mm -hmm. You can say it about Rawls's motivation, but it's otherwise it would be fairness in and fairness out. And that's that's not a very easy. Um, I guess I think that's but he does have the I guess that's what need a sense of fairness. Yeah, it, it's to it's trying to model a certain sense of equality and fairness from the beginning. And then by modeling that you're supposed to get a certain definite set of principles. Right? So there's this ethical impulse driving the move 
to go into the original position in the first place. And the question that I have is, well, if that's so, then maybe, you know, you do have substantive ethical values motivating the policy of non-interference. And maybe that helps him answer some of your objections about him being too externalist, uh, let's say, not, not tapping into the motivations of actual citizens. Then the second thing was with Mill. Mill is a utilitarian, so he doesn't think, for instance, his colonial subjects should be governed by non-interference, given autonomy, because in that case it wouldn't be to their benefit. They're not ready yet for autonomy. And he also, I mean, so there, there is a kind of basic utilitarian impetus behind his, his argument for toleration, and which is kind of complemented by his individuality, you know, his, uh, his argument from individuality where he say, you know, he thinks it's a good thing for all of us to be able to live by our own lights, our individual characteristics, and, and that's how we flourish. So in virtue of that, we should have some kind of policy of non-interference. And if you take that argument seriously, mm -hmm. Then again, you have something which doesn't quite fit. Sure, sure. Uh, so yeah, so uh, I completely agree that that there's lots in there. I mean, the book is thick with arguments. I think there are about nine arguments in in um, on liberty for liberty. But but the one that's that's really canonical in the tradition is the meta inductive argument. But you know, as I say, I think in the paper that if you if you take the argument from diversity. For that's, that's a, that, that appeals to a substantive value, like diversity. So, so Mill is thick with different kinds of arguments, but I do believe that this argument from fallibility and so on is just central to what I was calling the moral psychology of liberalism. About Rawls's commitment to fairness, well, the point is completely straightforward here. Yes, you and I know that that's his commitment, and he says that's why he's writing his book, but once, you, once the doctrine is, begins to be elaborated, <coughs> it can't be part of the doctrine. That's, that, that's, that's, that's what he's motivated to do. But the, the method must be described in such a way that you, you don't say, I mean, there's the times when, when draws in, so scandal and all talk of reasonableness and so on and so forth, and that. But, but I think all that actually is just not doing any favors to Rawls. But you've got to, you can't understand the project without understanding that it's a method in which you don't rule in fairness first and then and try and come to fairness after. It wouldn't be a method that's worth talking about if that were so. The ra rather the thing to do is to say, yes, he's motivated to get fairness out. That's what he's motivated to do. Now he's going to elaborate a doctrine and the the doctrine ca cannot ex ante mention fairness, otherwise it wouldn't be worth talking about. Um, you know, it would be just, uh, it, 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 would, it wouldn't have the kind of interest that I think it has. I mean, I find it to be a failed project, but a noble project. If I found that it was, it, uh, uh, if it was uh, starting with the assumptions that it was trying to prove, it would lack the interest that it has. And I don't think, by the way, I think he almost got away with it. The point is that the only reason why he did get away with it is because of this idea. I mean, if you didn't bring in this idea, I you don't you believe. I, did, I don't believe you have an argument against Rawls unless you bring in that idea. And it's not as if that idea was evident to everybody right from the start. So he almost got away with it. It takes a lot of spade work to prevent him from getting away with it. Yeah, I guess I have a follow-up question. I mean, it, I mean, Rawls' project may be a failed project for various reasons, but he does, it seems to me, characterize it as justice as fairness is about the fairness of the choice position, the fairness that goes into the design of the original position. You might get a version of fairness out of it, but I mean, he does characterize it that way. And if you, I mean, if you look at, he talks about reflective equilibrium mm -hmm. in a theory of justice. I mean, reflective equilibrium is meant to go back and forth between some of our intuitions about freedom and equality or, or, or fairness right. and the design of the original position. So, I mean, he's, he's admitted that that's his method in the book. So that's, that's my first question. It seems like you've, you've got to account for the fact that he does talk about reflective equilibrium as part of his project. And then the, the second it's question not part of the doctrine. It's not part of the reflective equilibrium says 
all of philosophy starts with intuitions and certain work, and they motivate us. But then we elaborate a philosophy, right? And you can't build it into the doctrine or the philosophy that you're elaborating that this is a premise from which you're going to get a conclusion that's virtually identical with it. I don't think you're doing Rawls any favors when you put it that way. The point of reflective equilibrium is to say, you've got certain intuitions, they motivate you. You come up with a doctrine to test whether you can actually provide that or not. But if you, if you come up with a doctrine in which it's part of the premises, nobody's going to be impressed by the conclusion that you've retained the intuition. Can I, I have a second question, actually. I just, that was a follow, quick follow-up. What, what would be, I wonder if the force, though, of Rawls' argument, I mean, you're, you're emphasizing the revisability, the moral psychology aspect, but I, I would have taken the force of his argument to be that we don't know what our conception of the good is going to be in this society, so we're going to want a certain degree of freedom because others may want to oppress our conception of the good life. And, I mean, you can make the argument without appealing to anything about revisability. Just the idea that I might be in the oppressed group, but that's and I don't know what that's going to be. Right, that's in the theory of justice, but in the constructivism lectures, it, he brings in the, the stuff on, on revisability. See, you've got, one thing you've got to keep in mind is that all of this has to do with the fact that, I mean, this is, for instance, in the passage on strains of commitment in the theory of justice. The, the view is that you've got to uh, start with the, the idea that uh, you've got a hypothetical contract, right? and it's an essential it's an essential part of the motivation that the hypothetical contract is going to be something when you adopt something in the hypothetical contract, you embrace a certain principle to live by, then in the actual contract. Right? You have to accept it wholeheartedly. Now, that's, this is in the strains of commitment passages, is absolutely clear. What you start off with, right, in, when you make a commitment to the hypothetical contract, say to the first principle, then when the veil is lifted and you've got an actual contract that you landed with, you must accept the conclusion you, the principle you adopted, wholeheartedly. That's why he rules gambling out. And all those passages of the strains of commitment which you rule gambling out, the whole point of it is to say, oh, well, it's about 10% chance that I'll end up being this highly devout and, and identitarian Christian or something. I have no chance of that. Let me take a gamble. Well, that's not how it all sets it up. He explicitly rules out gambling. So he's giving you a, 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 a method by which he says, no matter what, it's, that's why he calls it, it's a risk averse method. No matter what I imagine myself to be, I will choose this. And given revisability, you would choose it unless you bring in consideration of identity. It's perfectly correct to say that until the point when these considerations of Ulysses and the silence are brought in, as far as I can tell. So I think it's a tremendously ambitious program, and he will almost achieve it. This is why I think that, I mean, he did, you know, communitarians say he didn't achieve it, and so on and so forth. They do, they've got to dig deeper and find out why they didn't. And I think it turns on moral psychological considerations of this kind. Okay, I want to ask something about the end of the paper, which you didn't discuss in your talk. And that's where you talk about this idea of brotherhood and caring for others and that engaging in this moral dispute um, on the idea that somebody may in the future change is to show that you care about them as a person. And I didn't know whether you meant this in the sort of higher level of trying to convince somebody of liberalism and non-interference, or whether you meant it in any moral dispute. And I want to give you the following example, right? Supposing um, I'm a um, <coughs> right-wing Jewish settler who's settling in the Palestinian lands. And I insist on this, and um, obviously the Palestinians there disagree. If I go up to them to engage in dispute, insisting on trying to give them arguments, it's hard to say Absolutely. that that's respecting them right. and treating them as my brother. <laughs> and most people would think you're crazy. 
even more crazy than I thought before. Well, I think you're, you're profoundly right about that. Look, my, my view is on this is dialogue is just a tiresome notion to bring in here because it really is not what the issue is. It's really history and what it throws up. Nobody can say dialogue is a bad thing. But if, if, if you tell me, right, you, so, so I'm, I'm somebody who's, who's been dispossessed from my home, let's say, by, and say, I must have a dialogue with this? You can't have a dialogue with the master. The, 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 you don't have the conditions for a dialogue. If you, have, you, don't, you don't have a dialogue with the master. You resist the master. Now, within the overall rubric of resistance, there can be dialogue, but it's absolutely nested within the more fundamental, fundamental thing of resistance, and it's resistance requires all sorts of help from history. You know, it, 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 re it requires help from history, I and mean, you, you can resist in all of the, but you, you might be helped by all sorts of incoming uh, uh, states of information. In the paper, I give the example of how pro-choice people, pro-choice uh, was something that, that a lot of women adopted in the, in the late 70s and 80s. Not because of some uh, 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 dialogue they had with, with their opponents who, who convinced them, right? But a lot of women who had no commitment to pro-choice changed because of historical circumstances. You know, manufacturing industries gave way to service industries and so on. They opened up all sorts of jobs for, for women which they didn't have before. That made them deliberate and totally you know, uh, might they have careers and so on and so forth. That made, you know, internal contradictions. There was infirmity in their views, and so they deliberated their way out into a new point of view. It didn't come from dialogue. It came from historical developments. So in this, I'm just with Hegel and, and, and Marx, you know. History is what makes the difference. Not, let me talk with the person who's oppressing me, and maybe I'll convince him. But so then you're dropping what you said at the end of that paper where you did say you, know, you should engage in dialogue. Yeah. And uh, dialogue is not the point. My, my point about this, I mean, I really want to be completely hard-headed about this. The humanism consists in what you take history to be. It's what you take history to be that, that your humanism consists in. If you take the view that history is such that it may never throw out opportunity of giving internal reasons, of, of internal reasons developing in the other, giving it as just a specific case of it, then you have the, a view of history which is not humanistic. So, so I, I don't, if I mention dialogue, I should immediately excise it, because I really don't have in mind to make it a matter of dialogue. Well, Marx also said that people make history, um, right. so, um, Sure, okay, yeah. not necessarily, okay. But anyway, I really wanted you to address Uday's, uh, what I took Uday's uh, very interesting um, comments about identity, and presumably also cultural, I think, culture and identity. Uh, so I, I just really want to um, inquire, because um, I thought he was getting at partly uh, a conception of a, two things, ascriptive identity, that our identities are, uh, we're defined in certain ways and often resist those definitions, but also the fluidity of identity. I'm not sure, it's sort of at cross purposes with the way you, so I wanted to know what you thought about um, notions uh, which are, I mean to me it's, uh, which are distinctively modern in many ways, rather than necessarily just liberal, but modern. Uh, in the sense of more interactive, multiple, overlapping. A lot of us may feel the kind of commitment that you seem to want to focus on, but then there are various ones, and we're, as some people like to say, not my term, which I'm critical of, but negotiating them in, in various ways. Mm -hmm. um, so in Khomeini and Ulysses, I don't identify with either of them. Um, and I may want to tie myself in some respects, but not in others, and uh, they're more overlapping, multiple. Sure. How does that interface with your analysis, and also the ascriptive aspect? I didn't get either of those in your, you seem like singularly committed Correct. 
to a singular identity. Yeah. And I'm worried about that. Sure. No, I think, but don't be worried about it because I'm just frank about doing that, right? I'm, I'm just saying, uh, well, the, the thing is that liberalism can cope with all sorts of things. It's a very capacious doctrine. It can cope with all sorts. And if identities don't take the form that I'm suggesting, there's all sorts of negotiation that, that might be possible. Uh, so my interest is not in, in the difficulties a liberal state, say, might have with, with the cut and thrust of politics in which people are, are mobilized, even if they don't have any commitments, just because you know, they belong to a certain group. Right? And, and uh, uh, they're mobilized without any commitments and so on and so forth. So the, so the actual contingencies of, of politics is not what I think, where the moral psychology of identity raises its deep and hard problems for liberalism. I mean, those are things you can have a description of, and, and maybe liberalism can cope with it, maybe it can't, but it won't be for reasons having to do with, with moral psychology. I don't accept the view that the contextuality of, of uh, uh, identities of my, uh, uh, in any way spoils the identities I was talking about. So when they said, uh, you know, quoting Hannah Arendt, I think that I, my, I, my identity might only surface in some context when I feel oppressed, etc. Sure, but uh, I mean, I think that's what lies, and there's a sort of function that identity has, which is to resist Oppression. By the way, it's not the only function it has. You, uh, you can form identities of this kind under under um, conditions of triumph rather than defeat and, and uh, the need for resistance. Uh, you know, Linda Carley writes about how uh, the Scots decided they had British identity once Britain became an empire. Uh, so it's not just to, to resist, but, but mm -hmm. and I believe a lot of, of Jewish identity in this city came after uh, 1967. So, Hey, we're a great power. We demolish these people, etc. So, so identity comes under all sorts of contexts, with all sorts of, of uh, 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 background conditions, and I'm happy to formulate my view within the context of of you know resisting it. And, but then I want to formulate this view. So I could say, given that I feel the need for resistance, etc. Say. So a lot of Islamist identity right now, these perceptions of anti-Western perceptions, feeling colonized to this day, etc. Or Hamas, and um, they, they're going to say within the context of being oppressed, as Hannah Arendt said. I mean, I talk about a little bit of this in my paper, What is a Muslim? I, I do think that that's fine. Contextuality doesn't spoil the point I'm making at all. In certain contexts, this is the identity I would adopt. That's fine. I also, just one last point, uh, this idea of, of fluidity that I'm not capturing, maybe uh, Adam you have this in mind too, uh, I'm not capturing a lot of what the tradition of Bill and so on said because after all, a lot of the liberal tradition does say we can, under certain circumstances, give up free speech, etc. Well, that just doesn't work because, you know, that, the point is it doesn't give up ex post, right? It only, you, it, it builds in certain ex ante conditions under which you give it up. But once you build this, so it's like self-defense clauses on homicide. You build it in ex ante. Then it's, it's a law or a commitment. And so also if you're a liberal, you can build in various things, but it's ex ante built-in uh, exceptions, and then, then you commit it in just this way. But let me just, just one little follow-up. In terms of the moral psychology, too, yeah. just framing it in those terms, so maybe it would be clearer, it, does, it seems to me that there are more options than reinforcement or dissonance. That's what I'm trying to say, vis-a-vis uh -huh. -vis cultural identity. Uh -huh. In so, other words, there's more, a yeah. productive, I don't know, I have, that's not something I phrase in these terms, but I think that that it can be productive to have intersectional identities that are not, I mean, the whole feminist analysis of intersectional, intersectionality. Mm -hmm. It can be productive, whereas it's not strictly, re it may be, you want to call it, included under the term reinforcement, but I think it would be, um, you know, the kind of multiculturalism that I think one would endorse is not strictly 
right along the same lines or reinforcing, but the whole idea that it's uh, an intersection of, of a multiplicity of identities can be creative mm. in a way that isn't necessarily dissonant, nor is it maybe captured, or maybe it is, because I don't need to do it by reinforcement. So. Yeah, I think that is, there's no gain saying, I agree with you, Carol, that there's no gain saying that there is multiple identities, you know, a multi sender thing, expressing that too, and you quite right about that. It's just that under certain historical circumstances, some surface in ways that plurality and in this in this way. And you you make your other identity secondary. That does happen <coughs> from time to time. And it's a very fascinating question as to under what conditions would you give up identities of this kind? And I think it would be the negotiations you're talking about and somebody else talked about. The negotiations would have to, to try and, and make it uh, sort of infirm the reinforcements that it has. And I think that's, that's really part of what I was saying, the, the dependence on, on history as it's made by us uh, uh, would bring a lot. Uh, but I agree that the negotiations are essential. Um, but just declaring identities to be multiple as Sen does, it's just too glib. I mean, it's, so yes, of course it's multiple, but, some, but in some contexts, some loom lo much larger than others. Um, okay. Okay. Um, please join me in thanking Professor Bogdan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.